I met Winston on the school's campus in New York City. All right, thanks so much. Professor Ron. Hi, Michael. Good to see you. Good to see you. Let's head over this way. Please. Winston is a lawyer, tech investor, and author of several books on China's digital economy, including China's mobile economy, the digital Silk Road, and most recently, The Digital War, How China's Tech Power Shapes the Future of AI, Blockchain, and Cyberspace. It's so interesting to me because uh, I've traveled to China uh, probably not nearly as much as you have, having grown up there. But, but it's interesting watching one society and how it operates and, and how another society operates. And, and I think you probably know where I'm going with this. I would go to China. I would instinctively reach for Yuan to pay for something. My yeah. Chinese colleagues or friends, it's just their phone. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a cashless society. Yes. Uh, no, it's, it's a very interesting uh, observation, Michael, because uh, in many areas, right, China does not have the same kind of infra infrastructure like the U.S., like the credit card system, you know, uh, uh, like the banking system. Uh, but in an interesting twist, you know, these kind of, uh, uh, these disadvantage actually becomes a catalyst for China, uh, uh, for, for Chinese companies as well as the internet users to go more aggressively into mobile, right? So this relates to my earlier book, 2016 book, China's Mobile Economy, uh, because China's economy has become mobile first. Uh, because in many areas, there are no alternatives. So for example, for the nearly 1 billion internet users, right, uh, a majority of them had their first internet connection when they had a phone. You know, they never had a PC, yeah? So they, so, and they never had a credit card. So the only time they dealt with a, a, a digital payment is through mobile payment apps. They never had a history of dealing with a PC and a credit card. So they go aggressively into mobile. So everything is about smartphone, mobile payment, and internet processing. And that's a huge difference. The next frontier of technology advancement in China is in artificial intelligence. In 2017, AI-enabled computer program AlphaGo, developed by Google's DeepMind, defeated Ke Jia, the world's number one human Go player. It's considered the most complex game in the world. Winston says this moment was a turning point for China's AI priorities. Go match. That was big. Yes. Uh, explain why. No, to, to me, you know, that, that was a very dramatic image, if you think about it. You know, 2017, China hosted the historical match of the Go Chess between the best human player, which is Chinese, and the AI algorithm developed by the DeepMind lab of Google. So when you look at that picture, it is, it is full of metaphor. You know, it, you, you could say it's tradition versus modern, or you could say it's intuition versus algorithm, and you can say East versus West. Uh, but overall, you can always say it's about China versus the U.S. Uh, now, what's dramatic, even more dramatic is, you know, the, the, the game ended up with three to zero. You know, the machine beat the best human player straight without any hesitation. Uh, so maybe it was a coincidence, but within several months of that historical game, China came up with a national AI development plan. Which is what I was going to talk about next, which I yeah. think is really impressive because in 2018, yeah. China releases a plan to establish at least 50 AI academic and research exactly. entities. Yeah. Um, so they got the message uh, from this exactly. match. Exactly. Did the Loud United the States? Clear. Did the United States get the message? Because it seemed like China was like, "Whoa!" Yes. And they jump right in. You're absolutely right. You know, so many com so many countries talk about the AI revolution, the fourth indus industrial revolution. You know, and and that data is the new oil, right? But very few countries uh, uh, actually develop actually develop a national plan to develop AI as a national priority like China, right? And you could even argue that even the U.S. has not paid that much, as much attention as China. 
but you know, you, you, you see that the U.S. is catching up. Where is China at this stage with artificial intelligence um, and where are they headed? Yeah, no, it's, it's an interesting question. Uh, last four years, China has put a lot of efforts into AI research and the developments, and we have seen a wave of young startups. Um, at this moment, the business cases of ap AI applications are still relatively limited. You know, like a facial recognition is, a, is, a, is an important application. Uh, and in some areas, you know, they, they, they have some AI uh, 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 breakthroughs as well. You know, for example, AI-driven asset management. You know, China's stock market is crazy. So, so AI sometimes can do a better job than, than the human stock pickers, you know. Uh, but uh, overall, industrial applications, so for example, AI application in traditional industries, uh, manufacturing, you know, uh, healthcare, so on and so forth, you know, the, the application cases are still limited. Um, so, so, I, so I would say after a quick development phase, you know, last several years, now China's AI companies are entering into a new phase. Now they have to uh, uh, further develop their technologies and then more importantly, find more application uh, business cases, you know, in, in the large economy. Chinese President Xi Jinping also wants to devote research and development to another emerging technology, blockchain. Blockchain is a decentralized digital database which proponents say offers greater transparency, security, and lower costs. At the heart of technologies like Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies is blockchain. China has banned cryptocurrencies but has adopted a digital currency with about 20 million people currently using the digital RMB wallet. 2019, yes. President Xi delivers a speech talking about the importance of blockchain. Exactly, exactly. Now that was really uh, uh, phenomenal. You know why? Because blockchain is such a hyped but not fully proven technology, right? So President Xi's remark actually represented the first major global economy leader to endorse this interesting but unproven technology. By contrast, the Western leadership are much more conservative uh, about endorsing blockchain or even any you know, new technology. Uh, and I think you know, this actually represents the China uh, uh, thinking. You know, if there's a new technology, that may mean a new playground, and that may mean uh, China can start the competition with the West at the same starting line. In a digital currency, yep. uh, changes things, doesn't it? I mean, in terms of uh, the playing field changes dramatically yes. in a sense, doesn't it? Absolutely, you know, the, 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 the digital currency probably is the most immediate application of the uh, uh, blockchain push uh, at, from the China central government. Uh, because China has tested the, the digital currency at a mass scale, you know, probably the first uh, among all the, all the major global economies in the world. And if it is, if the digital currency will be formally released in 2022, uh, that may make China the, the first global major economy to officially launch the digital currency in a large scale. When he became U.S. President, Joe Biden said competition, not conflict, would drive the relationship with China. And when it comes to American technological innovation, President Biden called for more research and development investment. China and other countries are closing in fast. We have to develop and dominate the products and technologies of the future. The Trump administration was defensive. Yeah. Now we're seeing more of an offensive move yeah. on the part of the United States. How does that change the dynamic? Yeah. No, I think, you know, two sides, you know, on one side, you know, it, may, it means that the tech competition or even the digital war is real and accelerating, right? But at the same time, uh, it, it puts the focus more on the real tech competition instead of just the, the sanctions, blocking, etc. right? So hopefully, you know, all these innovation uh, competition will lead to more innovation. So, so China is putting a lot of national resources into R&D. And, and uh, uh, in the U.S., we saw the, uh, uh, 
the, the new Competitiveness and Innovation Act got passed, right? Uh, so this will lead to hundreds of billions of US dollars into IND in the US, uh, just like China. Uh, so, so on one side, it's, it's, a, it's a serious tech war, but at the same time, uh, it, is, it is also a, a good tech competition so that the, the main focus can go back to the innovation itself. Announced in 2015, Beijing's Made in China 2025 is a blueprint for bolstering the country's high-tech industries. The Chinese government is devoting hundreds of billions of yuan towards 10 key industries, including robotics, information technology, and medicine. How much ground did the U.S. lose in this digital war during this period of time, do you think? I think if the government does not step in, you know, the, the U.S. will lose this tech competition because in many areas, you need government spending to drive the innovation. Talk about the agricultural region. Why those regions are lack of uh, internet connectivities? Because they're remote, uh, because they're not as densely populated. Right. And also, you know, maybe a little bit of a, a tough geography there. Right. Which means the, the, the Internet infrastructure in those regions will cost more, you know, will require a, a more like longer capital return, you know, from the projects. And, and for that, you know, commercial capital may think twice, but the government has to step in, right, to put the resource and the capital in to put the internet structure there. You can kind of see battles along the way. You can kind of see how things are playing out. As we look at the digital war, right. uh, <laughs> what do we see right now? I mean, the, the US did try and stop Huawei, and in some respects, I think, was successful with its own allies yep. in pressuring them. Uh, but there are some countries that don't want to fall behind. I mean, if, if this is a digital revolution, uh, what's the playing ground look like out there? I think for a lot of countries, they're going to watch China-U.S. tech competition with anxiety, not because they, they care about this, who's going to win this, because they worry, you know, whoever going to win this, right, uh, uh, they will take the lion's share of the uh, benefit of the digital innovation. You know, the superpower is going to get the, 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 the majority of the, uh, the top value chain of the future global economy. Right. So, so for lots of the countries, especially the emerging markets, right, I think there's a lot of anxiety on them, uh, fear that they may be missing out, they, they may be behind this, this tech revolution. And they need so, you know, the support and resources from the, 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 the digital superpowers of China and U.S. To, to, to get on to this game, right? Uh, so, so it is a trillion dollar question, I would say. Uh, are we gonna see a digital Silk Road or a digital Silk Road block? I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah. what does the future look like to you right now? No. Uh, frankly, I think the uh, decoupling is really happening. And uh, in some areas, it is accelerating, right? Uh, because Huawei is a leader in 5G technology. Uh, and the U.S. is making every effort to develop a uh, uh, 5G technology alternative to Huawei, right, for the U.S. and its allies. Uh, and there, clearly, you see uh, a decoupling. And also, like semiconductor chips, right? And China imports a lot from the U.S. Actually, it's the number one uh, uh, import item for China. You know, 2020, China imported more than $200 billion of semiconductor chips. Uh, so, so right now, China is making every effort to develop a China semiconductor supply chain to make China self-reliant, you know, to, to, be China, to, make, to make sure China is less vulnerable to future U.S. sanctions. The mobile revolution has made smartphones indispensable for many people. As apps get more sophisticated at tailoring services to individuals, it also means more data is being collected. I kind of wanted to talk about some of the, maybe dig deep, some of the messages in here. And one of the ones that jumped out at me, I mean, early on in your book, 
If data is the new oil, then China is the new OPEC. I just love that line. Uh, I'm not sure a lot of people outside of China would love it, but, but what do you mean by that? It comes from um, the, the early narrative of the digital economy. Uh, when people think about AI is driven by data and the data will lead to more insights and more insights will lead to better products. And then better products will lead to, to more consumers, more data. So the cycle can go up. So, which means uh, the punch, you know, the punchline really means that if you are a big data market, eventually you will become the dominant market. What about data collection? There, there seems to be so much uh, controversy circling around data collection. Um, yes. Talk to us about that and the security of it. Yes, you know the the, the data collection in China is a huge issue. Uh, uh, traditionally, you know, funny enough. Uh, it was wildly believed that Chinese users would always trade their personal data and privacy for convenience and free stuff, right? Uh, but that's changing. But that's changing. You know, last couple of years, uh, you see a very big shift of the uh, uh, public sentiment towards data privacy. Chinese individuals, even the less educated Chinese, right? They they are wise enough to know there's a value in that data. And now they are demanding you know, more protection of the data, data and they want to get some of the value out of the data themselves. And that's why in the, in, the, in the recent years, you see a big movement among the Chinese public to push, more, push for more data, data regulations and to ask for more limitations on the big uh, uh, platform company's power to collect their data. Now, the question is, uh, to what extent uh, the, the, the data should be managed and then should be uh, uh, controlled? And, and how do you balance the, the, the data relationship from the three main groups, the, the, the people, the companies, and the government? And I, honestly, I don't think there, there is good legislation so far. So part of the reason we see these chaos you know, and the drama uh, around large platform companies like TikTok is because the legislation is still behind. Let me finish with one final question. Yeah. Uh, are you hopeful at all that these two countries can kind of turn the quarter? Because obviously, as you said, yeah. I don't want to have a phone here and a phone there. I mean, yeah. in the end, it's the consumer, it's the citizen yeah. that really takes it on the chin in, in a war like this. Yeah. You know, if you're asking me, I'm certainly positive because uh, uh, my last two decades, right, is a story about China-U.S. synergies. You know, I was born in China, and I was educated in both uh, uh, China and the U.S. You know, I become a, you know, here at the NYU Law School, right? And I become a, a lawyer both in China and the, and the U.S. Last two decades, I've seen so much value, so much growth, you know, and so much opportunities coming out of the. The, 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 the collaboration between the two superpower markets. And I think that's just too much out there for us to not to continue that synergies. So, so it's, it will be really important for us to continue be that bridge and be, 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 be positive and we, we can make this happen. Winston, a pleasure. Thanks so much. Oh yeah, thank you. Thank you, Michael.